Hello everyone and welcome to this week's video lecture on Grasshopper. Today we're going to be talking about this algorithmic and parametric design software. We've heard these words a few times. We've got parametric architecture, which is a lot of what we've been looking at this semester in method three. We've got algorithmic architecture, which is also a lot of what we've been looking at this semester. In fact, we know this image down here very, very well by now. So what is it? Well, effectively, it's mathematical variability given to our software. And that's a lot of complex words, and we're going to talk more about what that means. But effectively, it gives us more options. We have more freedom within our design to be flexible, to test as many iterations and ideas as possible. And we'll go through some visual examples of what that means in just a second. First, I want to show you a few places where you can find some help for Grasshopper. So I just need to identify up front that Grasshopper is quite a complex tool. Now, in this second year level of Grasshopper, we're only really going to talk about the basics of Grasshopper. We're not really going to go into too much depth. We're going to give you a few of the basic commands so that you can play around and experiment with your surfaces and have a bit of fun. But ultimately, we're not going to go too much into the full complexities of Grasshopper. Now, with that said, if you want to push further and harder into Grasshopper, you are most welcome to as well, of course. So I want to give you some resources that if you want to challenge yourself, you can go and do it as well. First thing, if you type in Grasshopper Primer into Google, click on the very first tab that comes up by ModeLab, and you'll get this document. Now, inside the document, you'll see, yes, well over 240 pages inside here. But if we go to the table of contents page, you'll see a fully linked directory showing you all sorts of things to do in Grasshopper. Really, this is a, a full manual of how to use Grasshopper, and it explains things in far more detail than we have time to get through here together in this video lecture. So if there's anything that you really want to do in Grasshopper, I recommend downloading the primer and having a look at through some of these tips, tricks, terminologies, exercises as well. Then, of course, we have LinkedIn Learning. My personal favorite course for Grasshopper is the one by Chris Riley. It's outstanding. It's how I learned Grasshopper when I was a student as well. I really, really recommend Chris Riley's work. There are a few other examples here as well. Chris Riley, we're going to be looking at a few of his exercises in our videos as well. So I always recommend coming back to that one. Now, let's get into some examples visually so that you can see what we mean by ultimate variability. So we've got uh, Rhino boxes here, points in space. Now we can do this, of course, in Rhino itself. We can just make some points in space and add some boxes to those. Where Grasshopper comes in, where algorithmic or parametric design comes in, is our variability. So let's say, for example, we don't actually know where these points in space are going to be. We want them to be random. Well, with things like Grasshopper, we can see we've got some elements plugged in here. If I play around on these toggles, I can play with the randomness of this shape. So if we're designing a surface that we don't actually know what the end state is going to look like and we want to be able to play around and figure out what that might be, Grasshopper gives us infinite randomness and variability inside that. So we have a lot of freedom to play within that field. So you can see purely by this slider here, I have infinite iterations at my fingertips. And so that's really the crux of what parametric architecture is. Let's have a look at another example. So let's say we've got this surface here. This is a very similar surface to the type of thing that we would have been making a lot in class. We've just rebuilt the surface and we've tried to put a, a rebuilt grid on top of it. So normally we would do rebuild and then we'd rebuild it by a U count and a V count. But what if we didn't know how many we want to rebuild it by? Well, in Grasshopper, we have a slider here that we've added so that we can, as you'll see these lines increasing, we can figure out very, very quickly by visualizing what it looks like. Well, this is three by three, this is a seven by seven, this is a 10 by 10, this is a 15 by 15 and so on. So we have extreme level of flexibility here very, very quickly. And that's why parametrics is so important. Let's look at another example here. So I've got that same surface that I was just looking at. And let's say I want to array some shapes along that surface. And again, we've done this before in Rhino. We know how to array a shape along a surface. That's not the difficult thing to do. The hard part is to play around with how many things are along the surface. Now, we could do one, two, three, five, maybe even 10 iterations to test 
how many spheres go along here to make it look interesting, but ultimately we're limited by the amount of time we can spend on it. If we use Grasshopper instead, you'll see that these spheres, if I play with this toggle here, this V count, I can make it infinitely editable. Another thing I've done here is I've embedded some mathematics into it. So you'll see that I've got A divided by B here. And we'll get into more of how that works a little bit later, but effectively what's going on is as the number of spheres is increasing, here we've currently got it set to six, so six in this direction, six in the other direction. As that number increases, I want its radius, which is set over here in its sphere, to decrease. So at E, the sphere size will get smaller as we increase our number of spheres. So if we see, if we bring it right the way down, we have massive spheres. All the way up, we have tiny little spheres. And what that means is we can control it in such a way that the spheres never actually intersect each other. This is pretty much impossible to do in Rhino directly, to be able to play with this so quickly and to manipulate and iterate as fast as this. So that's the crux of what parametric design is. Okay, let's start a new window together and we'll get started with some of the Grasshopper basics. I'm gonna close this down. Okay, so I started a new Rhino now. Let's have a go at starting up Grasshopper. So we type in Grasshopper hit enter and we'll see this loading dialog box and then we have grasshopper open in here now another place to help you with your grasshopper of course is the tutorials that pop up when we first open grasshopper as well so all the more help there for you now the first thing i like to do is make myself a little bit of room in grasshopper i can see we're kind of on top of ourselves at the moment so we've got a couple of options we can either do the side by side Typical like this, so we can see all of our Rhino tools and all of our Grasshopper tools. Uh, another option we can do is we can full-size Rhino, put Grasshopper somewhere where you would like it in the middle, and then you can just double-click on the top of the Grasshopper tab, and then every time you need it, double-click it again. Another option is to just minimize Grasshopper. It'll sit down here in the bottom left. When you're ready, you click on that button there, and it will bring it back up again. I'm going to go ahead and full size this for now so we can talk just a little bit about Grasshopper. Now inside Grasshopper you'll see some very typical things like we've got a menu bar up here where we can open new documents, save documents, our view types, display options, all those sorts of things. Then very similar to Rhino we have subsets of tools up here. So we've got our parameters, math tools, sets tools, vector tools, curves tools, surfaces, meshes, intersections, transform, etc. Quite a lot of similar terminology that we would recognize from Rhino as well. Also in the menu bar, we have the help tools up here and we've got some tutorial files as well. And these will show you how to do some of the basics in Grasshopper 2. Within each of our subsets of tools, we have different components, which we can see here as we pull it down onto the screen, it makes it active. So we can grab anything from up here inside our tool list and drag it down onto our working space. This working space here is called our canvas. So as we're working, if you're hearing reference to canvas, it's just the workspace that we have here. Our mouse works very much the same way as it does in Rhino. We use our right click button. We can pan around and see what we're doing. We can click left to right. We'll grab everything as it touches it and right to left only the things that are inside the circle. Zooming in and out just as normal with our wheel on a mouse. And then if we actually click the mouse wheel, we'll see that we've got a few different options here inside as well. As an alternative to clicking in our subsets to find a component, we can also just double click anywhere inside the canvas and start typing in just like we would in Rhino. It will make suggestions for us of the different types of things that are available as we start typing. We have some similar keyboard shortcuts as well. If we have some items selected and then click to drag and then click alt or hold down alt we can see that it's going to make some copies for us as well if we click alt first and then use our mouse we'll see that we have the ability to make more space inside our drawing area if we toggle alt one more time we can go in the opposite direction so toggle alt we can go this way toggle alt and we can go this way and this is going to be really useful for you later once you have lots and lots of components on the sheet you're going to need to be able to create some room as you're working as well so that's a really handy tool for that all right let's add a basic component to the canvas now i'm going to double click inside there hit pt for point and then i'm going to come up to construct point so pretty much every component will have both the inputs 
here and outputs here. If you hover over any of your inputs, you'll see it tells you exactly what it's looking for as an input. So an X coordinate is a locally defined value. Currently it's set to zero because nothing is defining it at the moment. Y is the same thing, also set to zero, zero. And then we have a point. If we open up in Rhino, we'll see that point is here, zero, zero, zero. So X, Y, Z is zero, zero, zero. If we were to add a number inside there, let's go ahead and change this to 10. And then we can plug that into Z. We'll see that that has jumped up 10 points from our Z axis there. Again, if we make that 1000, we'll see that it jumps up significantly way up here now. By the same token, we also have the outputs coming out of each one of our components. So here, if we hover over the output, we see one locally defined value at 0, 0, and 1,000. So x is 0, y is 0, and z is 1,000 at the moment. If we hover over the central point here, it's going to tell us what the component is called and what it's looking for as well. Now, depending on how you have your display set up, will change the way your components look. So if you're watching video tutorials online or you're looking at someone else's work and you notice that they've got an icon here instead of text, we can go up to display and then go draw icons and we'll see that that changes to an icon instead. I always recommend that while you are learning still as students that you actually turn draw icons off so that it has the full text on there. It makes it a little bit easier to see. Once you are more familiar and used to Grasshopper, you can of course change this to draw icons just to clean up your space a little bit, make it a little easier on the eyes. Now this yellow text box that we have here is what we call a parameter. So components we have which are going to create some sort of change or information happening inside Rhino, whereas we have parameters and all they really do is store information. So if we have another look at a different type of parameter, you would have seen before I was using a slider. So we've got a number slider easiest way to make a number slider is to just type in the variables of what you're looking for. So zero is going to be the bottom end of my number slider, 10 is going to be where it starts, and 25 is going to be the end point. So all I've done was double click, type in zero, bracket 10, bracket 25, and then that makes a number slider for me. And so I can go on there and I can see that that's going to change the Z dimension here as I scroll down on this point here on my number moves it down, then go up, moves it back up. And I, of course, can do this in all directions here if I want to, or I can make different number sliders as well. Now, Grasshopper is also color coordinated. So the color that we're looking for most of the time is gray, just like this. When everything's gray, it means everything's working normally. And if we click on it and it turns green, that just tells us what's selected. And Rhino is also clever enough to know that anything that's selected in Grasshopper that corresponds to Rhino, we're going to make that green as well. So I can see that my point in space here goes green when I select it. If I deselect it, it goes off. Now, if we right click this and turn the preview off, you can see that disappears in Rhino. And it also makes this dark gray as well. Right click, turn it back on, makes it light gray. So dark gray just means that it's not currently presenting. If I bring a text box in here, I add a bunch of random numbers, 10, 20, like that. And then I try and plug that into this Xbox here. We see that turns red. And then if we hover over it, it says data conversion failed from text to number. So at the moment, this is a text box rather than representing a number. If it was just one number, so for example, if it was 20, like that, it would be fine. And we can see it goes back to being gray. But because it was transferring to text because I had too much information in there, we could see it wasn't working in red. By the same token, if we add anything onto the canvas but doesn't have any information going into it, it will turn yellow like this, which is just a warning saying that we don't have enough information, so we're failing to collect data in there. And those are all the different types of colors that you might see on the canvas. So again, yellow means we need more information. Red, it's not working at all. Gray is the color that we are looking for. The next thing we want to consider is how we're actually dealing with geometries and curves inside Rhino versus Grasshopper. Now, of course, we can create curves and surfaces inside Grasshopper itself, but considering that we're spending so much time learning Rhino and so little learning Grasshopper, the best thing to do is actually do a lot of the work previously in Rhino, set it all up in there using the skills we know, and then bring it into Grasshopper in order to do some last-minute manipulations to it. So let's 
have a little look at how we would bring that in. If we jump over to our params and then geometry, and we go to curve, bring that on there. If we right click, go down to set one curve, we click on here and we can see that it is now turned red inside there. So if we click here green, we see it goes green inside there. Okay, and then we go over to curve analysis and length, just as an example of something we might want to do with this. Back over to our params, open a text box, bring it out here. So this is just a small little example. So let's say we've got a curve in Rhino. We want to know how long it is, okay? So if we click on our curve here, we can see it's currently six and a half meters long. But the beauty of Grasshopper, of course, is that it's always going to be editable. It's always going to be keeping up. So if I pull on this and I make it a little bit longer, we see that it's also adjusting in real time over here. So that as I'm making changes to this curve, either making it smaller or making it larger, it's going to impact the overall length of our curve inside here. All right, now let's have a look at another one. We're going to come up here and this time we want to bring our surface in. So again, back up to parameters and then geometry and we go over to surface, right click again, set one surface and we're going to click our surface there and we can now see when we click this, it's green. It's also green inside there. Just as an example of something we might do, let's go over to surface then utilities then divide surface and we can see that that's divided it into a grid of points in there. We can change the U count and the V count, which we know from our previous work in Rhino. I'm going to make a number slider again. Just double click anywhere in the canvas. I'm going to type in 1 is to 10 is to 100. Then I'm going to plug that into both our U count and our V count. I see that if I scroll this in and out, it's going to make more and more points along our surface for us. And that's just something very simple in there. Okay, so another thing to know about bringing elements in from Rhino into Grasshopper is that currently Grasshopper is dependent on Rhino being here in order for it to work. So for example, if I delete that surface, we see we now have yellow. We've got a warning because we don't have any information coming into this one. Control Z brings it back, makes it gray again. So there is a workaround for this. Right click and then internalize data and what that's going to do is it means that even if we delete, Grasshopper has got that memorized inside there. Now, there is a problem with this though, because once we've done this, we can't actually change any of the geometry that we're dealing with. We can see it's not really an editable shape. No matter where I go around or try and select it, it's not editable anymore. So we'd only ever really want to do this if we know for sure that we're not going to need to edit the surface or the geometry or whatever it is again in the future. If we're happy with that, we can, of course, internalize the data. Otherwise, what you would need to do is just save two separate files. So you'd save a Rhino file that has all the geometries that are still editable, and you'd have the Grasshopper file saved as well. And we'll show you how to save those in just a second. Now, if you were finished and you'd done everything that you needed to do, and you wanted to be able to then edit in Rhino, what we can do is we right click on the final operation, we click Bake, OK, and then we see we have our surfaces come back inside here. And now we now can edit it. But this edit is not impacting any of the stuff that's done in Grasshopper. OK, so again, this still isn't editable. Even though we've brought our shape back to life, it's not editable in terms of what's going on with the Grasshopper mesh that we've created inside there. So let's talk about saving. So if we're happy with our geometries, we're happy with what we're doing, we would just click and do a normal file save as in Rhino, and then we would do a file save document inside Grasshopper. And we need to always make sure that we have both of these, and you want to save them next to each other. So by default, it's currently saving my Grasshopper files in Rhino Seros 7 localization NUS template files. Now, of course, I'm going to lose that. I'm not going to know where to find it later. So just make sure you are saving your files in the same location as the geometry files that we have inside Rhino. All right, let's have a look at a tool called data matching. And we can see we've got some numbers over here and we have what may to beginners look like a complicated system, but I'll just explain it quickly so we know it's not very complicated at all. So we know that we can insert a component to construct some points, this one here. 
and we can see if I highlight that one it turns green and it's corresponding to some numbers that we have here. These are just locally inserted points so if I see if I hover over the X it's got negative 5, negative 5, negative 5 and if we look over here our red axis and our green axis here is here so we know that these points are just sitting negative 5 from the green axis or negative 5x. Y is going up from 0 to 2.5 to 5 to 7.5 and 10 that's right here so each one of these is just going up by 2.5 at a time and then in the z-axis they're not moving anywhere because they're all just staying on the same plane so this is just a panel which is explaining the coordinates that come out from the numbers that we enter and then it's copied again up here looking complicated all we've done is we've added some spheres around those points we've moved the spheres away and then we've added a preview toggle so that we can color those spheres in red then we've just replicated the same thing down here, made this one red. Sorry, this one's yellow, of course. I know what colors are. Now, from there, what we're doing is we're connecting points together. And this is where it's going to become useful for you. And this is what data matching is all about. It's about connecting points together. Now, this is the most basic version, of course. We're going to create some lines that connect this list together with this list. So the left-hand side points connecting with the right-hand side points is the most basic form. Around each one of those lines we've added a pipe, we've moved it along, and then we've made a preview to make the pipe grey so that it's a little bit clearer in here. That's really what all of this is doing. It's, it's not as complicated as it looks. But what we want to do now is our data matching, which we can find some options for under sets, then lists, and then I'm going to bring a few out. So the first one I want is cross-reference, next one I want is longest list, and then the last one I want is shortest list. So let's just talk about how each one of these works. So we'll start with our cross-reference. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to chuck this in between here and I'm going to bypass this. So I want this list to connect with this list and I want it to still make some lines for it as well. So we can see how this might be useful in creating our surfaces because if we have points in space and we want to connect all those points in space together, cross-reference allows us to use basic data matching to connect all those points together. Within cross-reference, we've got a couple of options as well. So if I right-click in the middle, I can change it from holistic, which is doing everything, all points connecting to all points, to diagonal, which means they will never connect to points which are horizontal or vertical from each other. So you can see that 4 isn't connecting to 4, 3 isn't connecting to 3, etc. Coincident, which is more dependent on when we have some verticality, so we won't see anything change yet. Lower triangle, we can see it's only affecting the lower half of the map, so 0 to 4, rather than 7 to 5 doesn't have an equivalent over here, so it doesn't get connected. That would be the upper triangle, which we see here, so now it is getting connected. All right, so that's our cross-reference, which is all about connecting points to points, as many as possible. Let's move that one out of the way for now. I'm going to put longest list in, plug that one into here. And then I'm just going to bypass these by plugging these ones in instead and Grasshopper is smart enough to automatically disconnect those ones for me. And so we can see in longest list what it's doing is connecting from left to right and then because it's longest list, anything that doesn't have a corresponding number is still going to get connected but it's going to repeat last, which we can see in here, to connect all the points that don't have a corresponding. We could change that to repeat first and we can see that this one here is doing all the repeating for us or we could change that to interpolate so it's going to split the difference along the path so again if you imagine this being a surface and we're trying to connect points together in order to create some geometries the different ways to connect those points will be helpful for you and finally let's try shortest list connect this one in here this one in here again grasshopper just bypass for us and we can see the difference now so longest list was going to connect everything shortest list is only connecting the points that have corresponding numbers so let's go trim start we can see it's trimming off the start and only going this way trim end is trimming off the end pretty self-explanatory and interpolate is once again splitting the difference so that's how we can use data matching to connect our points in space together and you could imagine that if we had a surface where we want to create some arcs from opposite sides of a surface or we wanted to create some objects that follow along certain paths within a surface but we didn't want to create too many paths 
this is a way that we can control the paths and control the flow before we then go on to do some more things. We don't have to just connect lines and make pipes. There's all sorts of information that we can do after we've used our data matching tools, i.e. cross-reference, shortest list or longest list, to control which information we want to prioritize. Inside Grasshopper, we also have access to mathematical functions. So if we come up to maths and then operators, we've got simple things like addition, multiplication, division, negative, all sorts of mathematical operations in here. And we can see that if we plug in some number sliders, so 27 and 9, 27 plus 9 equals 36, 27 take 9 equals 18, 27 times 9, 243, 27 divided by 9, 3, the modulus, so divides two numbers and returns only just the remainder. So 27 divided by 9 has a remainder, first number is 0. And then 27 to the power of 9, we have a large number here. So you might be wondering, why is all of this important? Why do we need mathematics when we're dealing with grasshopper? So you may remember we talked about this before. We have a surface, if I hide this just for now, we have this surface with some dots scattered over the top with a surface divide function and then on top of that wherever we have those dots placed by the surface divide we've put ourselves a sphere. Now the radius of the sphere is determined by not only the number of spheres that we're creating but a function relative to that number. So we can see that if we're increasing our number of divisions across the surface it increases our number of spheres but that number of spheres is also proportional to its radius by a division operator that we have here. So A is divided by B. So this number here comes in, and then we have 10, which is inserted into there, which means that our radius is going to get smaller as we increase our number. So ultimately, that means that we'll never have any spheres intersecting each other. Our spheres can get massive, depending on the number being really small, or our spheres can get infinitely tiny, depending on the number being really, really large. And that's just by using a division before we get to our radius of our sphere. If we plugged our number straight into the radius, we'd see that they all get massive and they intersect each other, which is fine down here. They're not gonna get in each other's way, but once we get out here, obviously this isn't going to help us create a surface. And so mathematical operators like this are a really powerful tool to help us in our process and make sure things are working the way we want to. As part of our math set, we also have in the operators, we have some comparators. So we can compare whether things are equal, larger than, similar to, smaller than. And what it returns is two sets of values, whether it's false or whether it's true. So we can see here we have 24 equals 19. That is not accurate. If we put here at 24, we can see, yes, that is correct. So that's true. And on this side, it's false. If we have 24 is larger than 19, we can see that is true. If we increase that, we return it back and we know that it's false. Is 24 smaller than 19? No, that's not true, but if we put it up here, we can see that it is true. And is 25 similar to 20? No, but we have a threshold here. We know that 25 is about 20, what, well, exactly 20% 20 out from 20. So if we increase this threshold, we'll see that that tips over at the point of 20 as well. And so why this is important is that it helps us split out information. So if we want to control what happens based on whether something is true or not, or whether our number sets are smaller or larger than a certain number. We can say that everything over a certain size is gonna be spheres, everything under a certain size is going to be squares or anything like that. So effectively it gives us more control. Another way we can control numbers is in our gates. So we go back up to maths and our operators and we see gate and, gate not, gate or, gate x or. So I've put a gate not inside here, and we can see that we've got an evaluation here. So this is a mathematical equation saying that x is larger than 5. And so we know that currently x is larger than 5 because x that we're putting in is 7.5. So we know that to be true. 7.5 is 
larger than five, that's true. If we bring that down below five, we'll see that that returns as false. And so why that is interesting to us is because using the gate, we can split out that information. So we can see we've got not correct here. So anything that is under five, i.e. false in this equation, is going to return for me a circle. And the radius is going to be determined by that number because it's plugging from 4.7 through to here into its radius. And then anything over five or true is going to be flipped by this not switch over to become a hexagon. So that means that anything in our number sets in the maths that's coming through that's over a size of five will be represented as hexagons. Anything that's under that number of five will be represented as circles. So this is a way that you can make really interesting patterns on your surfaces just by controlling the numbers. So you might take the curvature of your surface and say that any point that the curvature is really flat, i.e. giving us a low curvature, we would make some spheres there. Anywhere that the curvature becomes high, we will create some cubes. And so you have this grid of spheres where we have low curvature in our surface and cubes where we have high curvature in our surface. And purely by the manipulation of the surface, we could have a whole range of spheres and cubes playing in different directions, purely by creating a not gate here. And again, that's just in operators and a not gate. And that just says, if this is not true, then we go this way. If it is true, then we go this way. You watch our fancy wire going here. So currently it's orange, flip it over. Currently it's this way. And so we can see it's just switching the information relative to what we determine not to be true, i.e. x is greater than five. Not true, yes true. And we can see that swapping out over here. All right, let's have a look at creating a list of numbers together. We're gonna go up to sets, sequence, and then range, and bring that one on there. And we'll make some number sliders together. So zero is to 10 is to 100. I'm gonna plug that one in there. I'm gonna copy this one down by holding Alt. Then just so we can see what we're doing, I'm just going to grab a panel, plug that one in there, and we can see we've got a list of numbers. And then while we're at it, let's go ahead to vector, point, and construct point. I'm just going to plug these into here so we can see a visual representation of what that it looks like as well. So what a range does is it says, I have a number, zero to 10, Within that number, I want you to fill it up with 10 different points. We can see that 10 points. 10 divided by 10, we can see that's gonna evenly split it 10 ways. If we want to have more steps to get to 10, we can see it's gonna have to divide it up more times. If we have less steps to get to 10, so we have five, we know that's gonna give an even number of two to get there each time. So if we look over here at the visual, we can see that the overall width of our line doesn't change, but the number of points along the line does change. So this would be really handy for us if we wanted to, let's say, create a screen, but we don't know how big we want the spacing of the screen to be. Well, we can effectively make a line like this, and then we can drag the line across with our slider to see what different spacings look like very quickly. You can see how that would be helpful in architecture. All right, let's have a look at another way. So we jump back over to set, sequence. This time I wanna have a look at a series and I'm just going to copy all of this stuff down to make my life a little bit easier and grab another one of these because I need three. And I'll go ahead and plug these in, grab another number panel, plug that in there so we can see what's going on. Hide this one for now. And here we go. So series is a little bit different. So this time we're starting at 10 and we're doing 11 counts from that. So we can see we've got 11 options here, 11 numbers. Uh, and then we're stepping by 11 each time. So we've got 10 plus 11 equals 21 plus 11 equals 32 plus 11 equals 43, etc. And so we can see if we change the step shows how much we're increasing by each time. 
not increasing by anything there. If we're increasing by two, we can see it goes up by two every time. If we decrease the count, we can see we get a reduced number there. If we bring our point over, just to visualize it, turn that on, we'll see that increasing our number increases the length of our line, changing the step, changes how big a step we have each time, and then changing the starting position just changes its location relative to zero. So that's series. And let's have a look at one more sequence. Let's go to random. So say for example, you don't want to have a start input. You want to make it a little bit more random than you have previously. Well, I'm gonna copy these ones down, plug them in, and we can see Grasshopper is smart enough to automatically update these to range number and seed instead of start, step, and count. Bring another panel down into here, and we'll make some points in space as well. Turn this one on. Okay, so at the moment our range is zero, so it's only going to go to zero. If we increase this, we'll see that our range jumps out to somewhere between zero and 37. Because it's random, it doesn't have to go all the way there. Now our number is effectively our number of steps. We can see that we've got five points in here at the moment. The seed is kind of like the random generator. So it's not completely random because if we go back to eight, we can see it looks the same again. If we go back to 10, it's gonna look the same again, but it gives us some randomness in the sense that these points aren't defined by you. They're kind of defined by mathematical equations happening behind the scenes. And the seed is helpful because if you remember number five is the one you like and you do some work and then you want to come back to five, you can always just go back into there and get that number. We can see effectively that we're always going to have five of these. It's always going to sit within zero to 37, but changing the seed changes that distribution over here of where we're going to have our points in space. And so that gives us our randomness inside there. And of course, if we plug these into X and Y and Z as well, we can see that this is going to change its distribution depending on which axis, axis we're playing in as well. All right, now let's talk about moving geometry. So I've got a pretty basic geometry here. We can see I've constructed a point that's at zero, 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 which is down here. And I've got another point, which is at 10, 10, 10, which is over here. Then I'm connecting a line from point A into point B which gives us this line here. So say we have our line and now we wanna move it over to make a copy of it so we can do something else with it or just to move it for any other reason. If we go up into Transform, Euclidean, and Move, we can then plug that in here and we can see that our move, if we highlight it, the green one, has moved it 10 points up. Or if we hover over T, we can see it's moved it by 0, 0, 10. What if we wanted to get specific about how much it's moved? Well, now we need to talk about vectors. So vectors, much like if you think about Illustrator vectors or anything like that, is just information about which direction it's traveling. So we have, of course, X, Y, and Z directions. So if we want to travel in X, we would have an X ve vector. If we want to travel in Y, we have a Y vector. If we want to travel in Z, we have a Z vector. So currently it's only traveling at zero, zero, so zero for X, zero for Y, and 10 in the Z direction. So if we want a vector for all three, we can come up into vector, vector X, Y, Z, plug that into transform. Currently, these are all set to zero, so they're not doing anything. So let's just copy these sliders that we have over here, down, and then we'll copy X, Y, and Z. So we can see that's pushed over by 10 to the X, 10 to the Y, and then 10 up to the Z. If we change our Z vector, it's gonna push it higher up. If we change our Y vector, it's gonna push it wider down, and our X vector wider over in this direction. So you can see how adding in vectors gives us control over what we do. Now that might not be just to move it, it could be to scale it, it could be to rotate it, it could be anything you want, but vectors effectively give you the amplification and the direction of what you want to do in terms of any of those transformational tools.
All right, now let's have a look at how we can analyze some curves that we've got in Rhino in Grasshopper to do some pretty powerful stuff. So all I've done is I've drawn some basic freeform curves that we've looked at many times over and over again in Rhino. Then what we want to do is we need to bring them into Grasshopper. So I've got parameters, geometry, and curve. And I'm just going to go right click, set one curve, and I'll take just this one for now. Okay, let's have a look at a few ways of analyzing this. So we go to curve analysis, and then the first one we want to look at is evaluate curve, which is just this one here. Plug that one in, and then it's asking for some more information. Empty number parameter, so we know we need a number slider for that one. So we go zero, and then I'm going to go to 0 0.5, and then I'm going to go to 1.0. And we plug that in. Now we have an important next step. So in order to evaluate this curve most efficiently and to be most helpful to us, what we want to do is called reparameterize for this curve. And effectively what that means is when we reparameterize, we make the start zero and we make the end one. And so when we do that, we're dealing with effectively a percentage of the curve. And I'll show you what I mean by that. So if I click reparameterize, I can now see that this is set to 0.5 or 50%. And that means that this is now at the exact center point of the length of this curve. If I go all the way up to one, it'll go to the end, all the way down to zero, it will go to this end. So reparameterizing is really helpful because it allows us to see specific points along a pathway or specific points along a surface. Therefore, we can find where 20% of that curve is. We can find where the exact midpoint of that curve is as well. Really, really very helpful. All right, another one, let's go back up to analysis. Then we're going to go to curvature. And I'm going to use that same curve, bring that down. I'm going to copy this number slider again bring that in over here and then if we bring this across we can see that depending where we are along our circle it's going to give us a circle that corresponds with the radius of the curvature at that point. I'm going to make this a little bit smoother so we can see. Double click inside my number slider. Currently we've only got one decimal place. I'm going to change that to two decimal places. Click OK and we'll see that that gets smoother as we go along here so we can track that. So any point where we are along the curve, we can see what the curvature of that curve looks like at that point. Really helpful as well. And the last one, let's have a look at a curvature graph. So we go back up to analysis, curvature graph. I'm gonna bring the same curve in again. I'm gonna turn this one off for now as a preview. And actually what I'm gonna do is, let's bring in another curve geometry as this one over here is a little bit smoother. So again, right click, set one curve, click that one. And I'm going to plug this one in instead. Then I'm going to grab my slider, copy that over, bring that into here, which is our density. And I'm gonna bring another one down, plug that into there. So we need to change these though because we're playing with a different scale. So now I'm going to double click inside there. I'm gonna change my maximum range to 120. Okay, so now we should be able to increase the scale of this one here and we can see that we're analyzing the curvature through a curvature graph inside here. And then I can increase the density inside here. And I'm gonna change this instead of finishing at one, I'm gonna change this to finish at 10. I'm gonna click okay. We'll see that that's going to increase the density along there and I can play with the scale. So this curvature graph tells us what the curvature is like, but most importantly, when the curvature changes from positive out here to negative back this way, and we can see that that's the exact point of intersection along the curve. And so if we had a freeform curve going in multiple directions, we'd be able to see all the points along the curve that are positive and all the points along the curve that are negative. Let's have a look at another one. This time I wanna look at a division of the curve. 
which would be really helpful for you to be able to place things along the curve. So I'm going to turn the preview of these ones off for now so we can see what we're doing. Then I'm going to go up into curve, division, divide curve. And I'm going to plug our curve in there. And we can see that we've got a number of points along our curve inside there. Now we can set that number of course. So let's go ahead, 0, 5, and 20. And I can set that number in there. Currently it's now set to 5. I can pull that and push that down depending on how many I want. Now I want to do the same thing for my other curve as well. And I'll show you why in just a second. So let's bring that down. We'll plug in this curve instead. And we can see that I now have points in space. Now, what I want to do first is I'm going to delete the second number slider and plug in the original one to make sure we always have the same number going on there. Now we're going to do something really fun. What I want to do is I want to take the points along each of these curves, so 1 and 1, 2 and 2, 3 and 3, 4 and 4, etc., and create an arc that connects those two points together. So let's go into Primitive, and then into Arc SED, and then it's going to ask us for a few things. The start of the arc, the end point of the arc, and then the direction of the arc. So we know we want our start point to be one of these points on here. We want our end point to be the points along here. And then the direction of the arc, we can enter by setting one vector. So we click on that. I'm going to go out of my perspective mode for a bit. Hold shift in right mode so we can lock it in the Z axis. And then we can see we have some arcs along our curve. And because we have a counter here with our number of division, we can increase and decrease the amount of arcs that are going along our curve. Another cool thing is because we have our curve set in Rhino, of course we have our control points accessible. So we can go back into here and manipulate this geometry to create some pretty interesting forms that intersect themselves or do whatever we want them to do. And because we're in Grasshopper, it's infinitely editable. So we can test on here, well, how many arcs do I want to have? Or if this was an architectural space, how many cross beams do I want to have going over here before I get to the other side? And so we can play very, very quickly in terms of iterating just by using the divide tool. As you can see how this become very powerful for you in generating some interesting surfaces as well. All right, so now let's have a look at surfaces and how we can use a similar set of tools for analysis of our surfaces to create some interesting geometry as well. So we've got our surface that we've created here in Rhino, a bit of wavy business. And of course, we need to bring that into Grasshopper so Grasshopper can understand and interpret it. So once again, we go up to parameters, geometry, and this time we're going to go to surface right here. Again, right click, set one surface, click the surface that we want in Rhino, and we see that that is now selected. Again, what we have to do first is reparameterize, and just remember that that means that Grasshopper understands it as a ratio of zero to one. And that's gonna be helpful when we get to some of these graph features we'll get to in a second. All of our surface analysis tools that we're looking at are under surface, and then we have analysis. And we've got things like evaluate surface, surface curvature, etc. And then the other thing that we're gonna look at, probably most importantly, is under utilities, divide surface. Let's have a look at that one first. So I'm gonna take my surface, and I'm gonna plug it into surface divide surface. And let's turn that one on and see what happens. So in Rhino, we can see here that we're now dividing our surface into a number of coordinate points. And we've got 10 going in the U count and nine going in the B count. And we can adjust those and add multiple points in there as well. And of course, from those points, we can do some pretty interesting things. Like if I wanted to grab some spheres and chuck a sphere in at every point that we have along there, we can see that we now have a little sphere at each of the points. We can of course, increase the radius size if we want to. Currently set to one. We can change that to three. Commit changes. And we can see that that will increase the size of our spheres in here as well. So that's something that we can do, of course, by dividing up the surface into points along the surface. So that 
gives us opportunity to add some geometries at an even number of points distributed over the top of our surface. Let's turn that one off for now and this one as well. All right, so now we want to evaluate the surface and this is a good example of why we had to reparameterize. So I'm gonna plug my surface in and turn it on so you can see what we're doing. So evaluate surface gives us a lot of different information about what's happening at a given point in the surface. Now, what I wanna do first is bring down a number slider and show you why we have to use this guy. So if I plug my number slider into here, I can see that, well, I'm giving it a number, surely it wants a number for its U and V count, right? Well, as you can see up here, we have a U count and a V count, whereas here at the moment, we're looking for a UV count. So it's both coordinates in one. So in order to do that, we need to go to params, input, and then a multi-dimensional slider, an MD slider. And we can delete these ones out, click that into there. And then we see that it's giving us both 0 0.5 and 0 0.5. And we can see that that's in the dead center of our Rhino model. And as we move this one around, it's going to give us positions along our surface in space. So this is really helpful for us to pinpoint certain locations in space on our surface and get information out of that point. So we're going to get the exact point. We're going to get the normal or the direction it's traveling. At the moment, it would be going somewhere like this. If we get it up to the 0 0.5, 0 0.5, we know that it would be going straight up the page along the z-axis. We get a U direction, V direction, and the frame as well comes out of that. And we can, of course, connect things into each one of these just like we did our spheres and figure out what that changes. So we could have a bunch of cylinders coming out of here and then depending on where they are relative to the curvature, they might start changing their normal direction or doing other things as well. So that's quite useful as well. Let's turn that one off. And then let's plug our surface into the next one, which is surface curvature. Okay, so we've got a point in space here. And what we're doing is effectively creating a point anywhere we want to along our curvature. So curvature is also splitting out a Gaussian and a mean without getting too much into the maths. Effectively, it's going to allow us to interpret the data based on where we're positioning ourselves along the surface. Finally, into the last one down here, we're looking at an isotrim surface. And we're going to plug these ones into here. Let's have a look at what that's doing. Here we are. So we can see that we're subdividing our surface into a number of parts. So this is going to be really helpful if we wanted to create tiles or panels within our surface. So we can increase the number of panels inside there. We can decrease the number in the U or the Y direction. And then what is really useful is selecting one element of that. And we talked about list items before, and if I turn this one on, you'll see that it's selecting one panel only of the division that we're looking at. So this is the 40th panel. If I bring the number down, it's gonna get back down to zero. So the very first one, bring it all the way up, it's gonna to go to there. Now we've got more num panels than 75, so it's only taking us to that one. But you can see how this would be useful. So you could take specific panel, and then do something to that, i.e. have a geometry that comes out of it. But more importantly, if you remember back to our mathematical functions before, you could take all of the even ones, so split it every second one and add a geometry to all of those. You could add it to all the ones along a diagonal. You could use your cross-reference to connect certain points. You could use shortest list, longest list. So now it gets really interesting that you can use all of the components that we've talked about in terms of the mathematics to control elements like this. And so instead of just dealing with one, you can get really specific about which ones you want to use. And you can imagine how that could make for quite an interesting surface if every second one of these has a sphere coming out or a rectangular prism or the odd ones all have spheres and the even ones all have prisms or whatever you want it to be, you can manipulate the data based on the mathematics of this. Okay, so the last thing I wanna show you is something to simplify your geometries, uh, help your computer run a little bit faster and make things a little bit easier for you in terms of the modeling. Sometimes because we're dealing with a mathematical surface rather than a, a polygonal surface, i.e. 
it's infinite in terms of its curvature, it's constantly computing, it makes Rhino slow down, particularly once we start to array different objects over the top of a wavy surface, or we have thousands of different things coming inside which are all computing constantly. Sometimes it's easier just to convert them into meshes or convert them into polygons. A good example of this is when we're looking at a movie or looking at a game, we're actually looking at computer-generated polygons rather than infinite uh, mathematical pixels. So there's a finite amount. So let's have a look in our final step at how to turn this surface into something that is a little bit more finite and easier to control. So once again, we have to bring our surface in. We go over to params, geometry, and then surface, right click, set one surface and now our surface is part of grasshopper as we can see there next thing we want to go is to mesh utility and then mesh surface and this is going to allow us to convert our surface into some polygons instead of the current infinite mesh infinite surface sorry all right so we know we need a u and a v count so let's just make a slider for that zero to ten to one hundred I'm going to plug this into both of these. Okay, and we can't quite see what's going on over the top of here. We see something's going on as we change this in and out, but we don't really know what's going on. So let's make it a little bit easier for us to see what we're doing by doing a move. So we go over to Transform, Euclidean, and then Move. This is our geometry that we want to move over, and we know we want to move it to just over here. So we can do things one of two ways. We can set our number, but let's just make it a little bit clearer what we're doing. So we know we need a vector, and we need a vector x, y, z. I'm gonna plug that one into here, and then I want to just set my y axis. So I'm gonna right click on the y, and then I'm gonna change that to five commit changes. And then I've just see I've moved that over by five. Next thing we wanna do is go back into our mesh, then we want to analyze our mesh and go down to mesh edges. We plug our geometry in there and we can now see that the result of our mesh UV is creating a bunch of polygons which represent this surface that we had here. So if we reduce this down, we'll see what I mean. So if we bring this down to a much lower number, let's say we have two or four. That's going to bring four in the U count four in the V count. And we can see that instead of this complex, sinewy, infinitely curved surface, we now have a series of fractals. And this might be really useful for you if you wanted to create more of a fractal geometry in terms of your architecture or your surface. You can just decrease the U and the V count by creating some meshes instead to work with. If we increase that U and V count, of course we see we get closer to those curves but this will still be significantly faster for Rhino and Grasshopper to process because we're dealing with a finite number of panels rather than infinitely curved surfaces, which we see here. The last one we want to look at is back under analysis, and then we have deconstruct mesh. Let's grab our geometry again and plug that into there. So once again, if I turn this off just for a second, it's similar to our evaluate surface that we did before, but instead now we're evaluating a mesh. So we have our vertices, our faces, our colors, and our normals coming out here again so that we can add some different geometries inside here. Another useful tool is instead of using spheres inside Grasshopper, we can use mesh spheres instead. So we come over to Primitive inside our Mesh tab, go over to Mesh Spheres, and we'll see that if we plug a mesh sphere into each one of our vertices, and then we change the radius down to something much smaller. Let's go 0.2, commit changes. We'll see that we've created a whole bunch of spheres over the top of each one of those vertices. If we make that a little bit clearer again, we'll go down to 0.1, commit changes. There we are, we have all of our spheres here. And those of course will increase and decrease with our U count and our V count because the vertices that came out of here was dependent on how we divided up our mesh surface from before. So obviously the more polygons we have, the more vertices we have, and therefore the more spheres. Now, these will still look like spheres when they get 3D printed, but what we'll see as we zoom in 
that the sphere is actually made up of polygons as well. So it does have edges to it. Now, you can think of these edges as going to come out lumpy and bumpy, but ultimately at the end of the day, when we're dealing with 3D printing and things like that, the 3D printer is only going to see so much resolution, depending on the type of 3D printer you have, of course. Sometimes you want to deal with uh, perfectly smooth curves, which th some 3D printers can handle. Other times when the curves are going to be so small that you don't notice it, it's probably better to use mesh spheres instead, as it will not only make your computer run faster, it will make the 3D print run faster as well. So that's how we can use meshes to make our lives a little bit easier. We can convert our surfaces over, we can use mesh spheres or mesh primitives instead, and that will make everything a little bit easier. All right, that's enough for our first round of Grasshopper. We've looked at a few different tools here. Mostly we've just been looking at the ways in which we can interpret information in Grasshopper. And in the next video, we'll get into some more detail about how to actually use these tools and how they apply more to architecture and creating your own surfaces.